We have been uh, speaking to those working on the front line throughout the crisis and today is no different. One of our regular doctors, Dr Larissa Corder, is an obstetrician and gynaecologist who was transferred to work in intensive care at the start of the crisis. She's now returning to her own department. Let's uh, take a look back at some of her thoughts over the past couple of months. Working in the intensive care unit, you really see the effects that there's horrible virus has on people and it's not just a question of it affecting lungs as we thought initially and causing pneumonias it, it can affect pretty much every single organ in your body one in four doctors is off in self-isolation and one in five midwives so it's making us worry about potential shortages and how we're mm. going to deal with growing demands just seeing so many of our patients now finally get better is really really heartwarming but we have to remember that this is a very gradual and slow process Larissa, thank you for joining me today. You finished your final shift in intensive care yesterday. It must have been quite emotional for you. Yeah, even just looking back through that tape, it, it brings up so many emotions and it's really been quite a roller coaster, to be honest with you. Today has literally been the first day I've been able to let my hair down a bit and sort of reflect on everything that's happened and no doubt it's been a really intense and challenging period of time but it's also been one of the most amazing experiences of my life and I feel so honoured and privileged to have been able to use my skills to serve people on the front line at the cold face of this entire pandemic and to work with the most incredible and amazing team who've supported me no matter what challenges and obstacles we face together, it really feels as if I've built a family that I'm going to carry with me forever. And I also feel really, really grateful to all of you for allowing me that platform to share and honour the stories of all the people and patients who I met, because those stories will really be their legacies, even in the ones who, who don't survive and whose lives we can't save. Yeah, and uh, mustn't be forgotten in all of this. Uh, what part of working with COVID patients were was uh, worse than you were expecting? Well, one of the biggest challenges we had um, at the beginning and, and we still have is the fact that this is such a novel virus and we've never seen anything like this in terms of the scale of destruction that it's capable of causing. And what we thought would start off as a basic pneumonia actually turned out to be a multi-system disorder affecting pretty much every single organ in your body. Um, it's also really bizarre that for some reason, some people seem relatively immune to it or only suffer very mild symptoms, whereas others can have raging symptoms that bring them into intensive care and mean that 50% of those just don't survive no matter what we do. So that is incredibly confusing and also really, really frustrating if you're a doctor or a nurse dealing with something like this to not have an effective means of curing people. We've also heard about all the challenges my colleagues um, around the country have faced regarding personal protective equipment, fearing for their own lives and their own livelihoods and living separately to their families for many weeks and months in some cases. So my biggest fear out of all of this really is the mental health toll that this is all going to take on, on a group of people who's already really vulnerable. We're not starting from the point of zero. We already know that doctors and nurses suffer from immense anxieties and depression and the rate of suicide is very high compared to the general population. When you add in the responsibilities and the stress, especially for those that have been at that coal phase, it all makes for a system that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's what I'm really fearful of, people potentially developing that, as well as many patients who come out of intensive care who suffer from very intense deliriums that we've never really seen before. And that's incredibly frightening and very, very harrowing. So all in all, I think that we need to expect a situation where mental health is going to be a big issue and we need to have effective strategies for dealing with that. Yeah, there's no uh, vaccine for mental health, is there? And obviously non, no vaccine on the horizon for that. Um, how difficult will it be because within the medical profession, as opposed to the patients who, who can go home and start to begin their recovery, they will be in a situation, you will be in a situation where there is no respite because your day job, the, uh, the backlog of routine operations uh, is there. That's what you've got to face next without uh, many of you getting annual leave and any real time off and no time to process what you've just been through. Yeah, and, and that's right. I think that, you know, this problem of mental health will potentially continue to perpetuate itself because we are 
going to be dealing with that backlog. And it's really important that we now start to think about reopening normal services and allowing all the elective cases to come and be treated. There's been so many people who have been suffering with cancer who we've not been able to treat. And that is really, really tragic um, and awful. So we must carry on doing that. But at the same time, we have to take note of the fact that many doctors and nurses and cleaners and pharmacists, everyone who's contributed to this pandemic and, and helping within it, are seriously exhausted not just physically but mentally too and emotionally and so when we talk about the reality of a second wave it's really important that the public takes that seriously and understands that their actions from now on can have really serious consequences and if we do have a second spike or a second wave at this time in a resource deplete NHS then we we could be heading for a catastrophe and we just can't afford to let that happen so I think the public needs to hear guidance from leaders who are authentic and real in giving out this advice. How concerned are you about uh, the reality, the potential of a second wave when we've got all this uh, ongoing discussion and confusion about the lockdown rules simultaneously with next Monday, a lot of the uh, lockdown restrictions being eased in England? I'm really concerned. I completely understand that people are desperate to get out and to resume some sort of normal. But I think we have to get used to the fact that the normal we're going to have is going to be a new normal and actually there are still going to be rules we need to follow about social distancing because we're not through this war yet and it's really really important that everyone takes heed of that. I know colleagues who return home from work and I've been in this situation myself, we've discussed this before, where we've been driving home after a really long shift we've seen people die we've not been able to help them or rescue them and then we see people out and about disrespecting the walls hanging out in groups and it's made us cry it's made us weep and it almost feels as if it's a little bit of a slap in the face when actually we have done so much to help move us out of this pandemic so i just really hope that people can respect what the front line has been dealing with and please please just continue to make some level of sacrifice in dealing with this because the sooner we do that the sooner we can all get back to normal and that's what we all desperately want dr larissa corder thank you very much thank you